My Fujifilm X-H1 has been a trusty workhorse for quite a few years now. I went through several other mirrorless cameras before deciding that it was the one for me, and after shooting with it exclusively for over three years, I can soundly say at this point that it was the right choice. That was three years ago, though. As of late, fierce competition from Sony and Panasonic, along with somewhat boring and iterative releases from Fuji, have left me and my aging X-H1 peeking over the fence at what certainly looked like greener grass. But that ends today. The X-H2S is Fujifilm's new flagship APS-C camera, and it appears to address almost every shortcoming of its predecessor, while in many ways leapfrogging the competition. But that's all on paper. I'm Griffin, and today we'll be seeing how well the X-H2S holds up in the real world. Let's get to it. Starting off with the build, the body is both smaller and lighter than the X-H1, which was always a bit of a chonker, especially for an APS-C camera. The grip on the X-H2S is both fatter and shorter than its predecessor, and while it'll depend on the size of your hands, I personally find it a step in the right direction. Back when the X-H1 was released, Fujifilm made a pretty big hubbub about the specially formulated black coating on the X-H1's body and its impressive Mohs hardness rating of 8H, and it's kept my camera almost completely scratch-free for several years now of fairly hard use. While Fujifilm has made no mention of it, it appears the X-H2S didn't get the same treatment. The X-H1 has a smoother, glossier kind of hammer tone finish that reminds me a lot of Cured Pour 15, whereas the X-H2S has more of a grittier, sandblasted feel to it. Time will tell, but I suspect the newer coating might not hold up quite as well. The eye cup is made of a softer, more foam-like material, and it's also shallower, which is a welcome change for those with glasses. The cup itself has a quick release mechanism that can be activated by pressing on either side, and it makes removing it for cleaning much easier. The flip out screen is a first for me, and I don't think I'll ever be able to go back. It did take a little bit to adapt, especially for photography, after using the tilt screen on my X-H1 for so long, and I have to admit that the flip out mechanism, it doesn't feel quite as rock solid as the tilt mechanism did, but it's not so much that I think it'll ever be an issue. Now for the controls. Starting with the small changes and working up, the X-H1 used clickable scroll wheels, and the X-H2S does not. Personally, I never really liked these on the X-H1, they just felt kind of mushy, and I'm glad they're gone. The thumbstick is much larger and grippier on the X-H2, which is a welcome improvement from the tiny, sometimes fragile feeling thumbstick on the X-H1. I'm very glad to see the top screen was brought over though, since it was one of my favorite features of the X-H1. It retains the backlight for night shooting, and it works just as well here as it did on the older camera. The hair trigger shutter release on the X-H1 definitely took a while to get used to, and by a while I mean like a year or more, but now that I have, I really never want to go back. The X-H1s had a mostly even linear actuation force all the way down that made half press to focus pretty difficult to distinguish by anything other than muscle memory. I lent my X-H1 to a few people over the years and they were always kind of thrown off by the shutter release. The X-H2S has a much more refined version of this. It's still clickless, but the actuation force is much lighter until reaching the half press point where it becomes noticeably firmer. This improved feedback has all but eliminated accidental shutter releases for me, and it should make it much easier for people new to the X-H line to pick up and shoot. And finally, that brings us to probably the most controversial change with the X-H2S, the removal of the dedicated shutter and ISO dials in favor of a more traditional PSAM arrangement. I suppose this one basically boils down to personal preference, but if you can set aside your torches and pitchforks for a moment, you might find there's a reason professional cameras switched this control scheme back in the 90s. It makes it possible to use the camera with one hand, which was a complaint I had with my X-H1. Now, did I learn to work with the dedicated dials? Of course, but I haven't missed them once since I got the X-H2S, and I think that really says something. Moving on to using the camera. The interface should be familiar to anyone who's used a Fujifilm camera since they refreshed the UI in 2016 but there are a few improvements here worth touching on. First is the introduction of what basically amounts to menu themes. Fuji cameras have always had these relatively low contrast gray menus that at times could be difficult to see, especially in direct sunlight. They've added a high contrast theme that I use pretty much all the time, as well as a low light theme that darkens all the menus and turns the UI red. 
Another nice touch is that the Q menu can now be set to have a transparent background. It's important to note that some of these UI changes may have been present on other Fujifilm cameras already, but I'm pointing them out in this video because it's the first time they've come to the X-H line. For video, the X-H2S can shoot up to 6.2K full sensor open gate footage in a 3x2 aspect ratio. While this is great on paper, I find the format to honestly have limited usefulness in my workflow so we won't really be covering it a whole lot here. Of greater interest to me are the downsampled 4K 30fps and 60fps modes, which no longer introduce a crop like the 4K did on the X-H1. And more importantly, you no longer have a record limit. As long as you've got power and card space, you can keep on shooting, and it's about time. Your shots can also be taken in a much wider variety of codecs, including H.264 Long GOP, H.265 All I, H.264 Long GOP, H.264 All I, ProRes LT, ProRes 422, and ProRes HQ. Options are great, and I love that Fujifilm is including ProRes support in camera, but it can get a bit overwhelming, especially to less experienced users, and I think Fujifilm could stand to pare down some of the options. For instance, Fuji gives you the option of manually selecting either full range or limited range video recording levels. This honestly should just happen automatically though. ProRes must be shot with limited levels, and all the H.264 and H.265 codecs should all be shot with full levels. It's a bit frustrating that the camera doesn't just select the proper level for your chosen codec automatically, and I imagine this can be especially confusing to less experienced shooters who might not even know what video levels are. Once you do get everything set up though, filming with this camera is a joy. The dynamic range is several stops higher than the X-H1, but you really only notice that when filming in F-Log2. The film simulations all seem to have a similar amount of dynamic range, which makes color matching to the older X-H1 very easy. In any of the film simulations, as well as F-Log1, the camera has dual native ISOs of 640 and 1600, but when shooting in F-Log2, the native ISOs increase to 1250 and 3200. This, along with the backside illuminated sensor, yields a nice improvement in low light performance. The downsampled 4K image is clean enough to use up to, I would say, ISO 6400, and for YouTube, I wouldn't hesitate to shoot at 12,800 in a pinch. It's no A7S III, but Fuji's slow and steady generation over generation improvements do make a difference over time. F-Log View Assist is a new feature to the X-H line, and it makes exposing log footage much easier than on the X-H1. If we take a look at a color chart while using the Astia film simulation here, you can see, with the help of a vector scope, that the color science has actually changed a little bit, with the X-H2S being slightly less saturated than the X-H1. With a bit of tweaking though, you can get them almost perfectly matched, which is nice if you keep your older cameras as B cams like I do. On to autofocus. This is the best autofocus system Fujifilm has ever put in a camera, bar none. The tracking is excellent, and it's dumbfounding how far away it can put a box around a subject's head or eye. We've also introduced animal autofocus, and whilst I only have cats, it does track them remarkably well. It's not on par with Sony yet, of course, but if Fujifilm can release a few of their much lauded Kaizen updates to bring the accuracy on par with the tracking, they could have a real contender here. Again though, the quantity of settings surrounding the autofocus does make things a bit confusing. For my testing, I used the out-of-box default settings and only found two ways to repeatedly make the autofocus trip up. First, the tracking isn't fast enough to keep up with subjects moving horizontally or vertically along the frame if they're going too quick. See here how the tracking box lags behind my head by a few frames on the three-wheeler? I thought that might just be the on-screen graphic, but when I zoomed in and post and took a closer look, the focus does lag behind. This scenario rarely comes up though, and I don't expect it to be much of an issue. And secondly, and this is more of a minor thing, I've occasionally had some instances when shooting a crowd where it'll randomly lock on to some guy in the way back right of the room, and the foreground people will be out of focus. But this is one that's been more of a rarity. Burst shooting on this camera has improved, and it's pretty ludicrous. It can do 40 FPS raw burst shooting with electronic shutter, and 15 FPS with full mechanical shutter. I mean, listen to this. It's like a machine gun. Moving on, the IBIS now has seven stops of stabilization versus the X-H1's five and a half stops, and I found it to be quite a bit smoother and more predictable, especially when panning, which was something the X-H1 could be a little jittery at even after its 2.0 firmware update. This shot of me on my three-wheeler here was taken handheld 
using the 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens with OIS and IBIS enabled. It really is amazing just how far IBIS has come in recent years, and if you don't count Micro Four Thirds cameras, Fuji's implementation is among the best on the market. When shooting slow motion video, the footage is still conformed in camera. And despite having an option for everything else, there's no way to turn off in-camera conforming. But at least we do get 4K 120 now, albeit at a 1.29x crop. And it looks quite nice. Surprisingly though, we're limited to just 240 FPS slow motion at 1080p. Now, I would think that if you were shooting a quarter of the resolution, you'd be able to shoot that resolution at four times the frame rate and maintain a similar data throughput, which would be 1080p, 480 FPS, but I don't know, maybe it doesn't work like that. Either way, it's still a major step up over the X-H1. And that's most of the major points out of the way. Let's blitz through the small stuff before we wrap this up. I really like the new strap mounts. The old ones kind of sucked, and the new ones work way better with Peak Design's quick releases. The EVF is now 120 FPS versus 90 FPS on the X-H1, and at a higher resolution of 5.76 million dots versus 3.69 million, nice, on the X-H1. Charging the camera has been a bit hit and miss because it's kind of picky about what power adapters you use. The included one works fine, of course, but my laptop charger, which works with every other USB-C device I own, doesn't. Not sure why, and it doesn't help the Fujifilm doesn't include a separate battery charger anymore either, making plugging in the camera your only option for charging. ProRes can only be recorded onto a CF Express card, even though a good SD card should be more than capable of keeping up with ProRes LT's data rate. I have no comment on the fan attachment other than to say that, as with my X-H1, None of my shooting has ever caused the camera to so much as throw a thermal warning, let alone overheat. And that's about a wrap. It's a solid upgrade in all aspects to anyone with an X-H1, and enough of a technical achievement to put Fujifilm back at the head of the APS-C pack. At its $2,500 price point, its feature set makes it a compelling offering regardless of its sensor size. You'd have to spend quite a bit more money to get a stacked sensor camera with the speed of the X-H2S from any of the other major brands. And when you pair that with the improvements to autofocus, I think Fujifilm just might have a winner here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked the video, hit like, get subscribed, and ring the bell so you get notified when I post new videos. And I will see you guys in the next one.